Monday, July 18th. It is 4.10 p.m. And uh, we are calling the meeting to order here, and then we are going to go into a recess uh, so that the council can go with city staff to tour the under construction new city hall for the city of Twin Falls. And then we will return here for the balance of the agenda. So with that, we will stand in recess. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a quorum of the City Council here this evening. Six uh, of our members are here. Councilman Lanting was not able to join us. Uh, Mr. Rothweiler, are there any amendments to our agenda? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council staff would ask that you add an item to the consent calendar appearing as item number four should you make this addition. The item would be approval of a beer and wine license transfer uh, for the owners of, of, of ownership for Red Robin Gourmet Burgers and Brews doing business at 1824 Blue Lakes Boulevard North Twin Falls Idaho we placed a copy of that item uh, before you for your consideration thank you Travis Chris Dockington I would move approval of the consent calendar with the addition of the um, Red Robin beer wine liquor license transfer second I have a motion by Chris Dockington seconded by Don Hall to approve the amended do we need to actually amend the agenda first or can we just add that to the consent calendar Fritz sound like it was combined in a single motion and that's okay. that's okay all right thank you so motion to approve the consent calendar with the inclusion of the beer and wine license transfer as outlined by our city manager is there any council discussion seeing none Sharon roll call vote please Suzanne Hawkins yes Nikki Boyd yes Sean Barriker yes Chris Talkington yes Don Hall yes Ruth Pierce yes motion passes six to zero so we went ahead and jumped down a little bit on the agenda there too so I'll I'll uh, rewind this now uh, we have no uh, proclamations this evening so the next item on the agenda is uh, general public input so uh, just to clarify our public input procedures for this evening uh, and this is printed on the back of the agenda uh, individuals wishing to provide public input regarding matters relevant to the city of Twin Falls shall wait to be recognized by the mayor uh, approach the microphone podium state their name and address and whether they are a resident or property owner in the city of Twin Falls and proceed with their input <clears throat> uh, our procedures allow that the mayor may limit input to no less than two minutes and that individuals are not permitted to give their time to other speakers so this evening uh, I will be limiting uh, each individual's public input to three minutes we'll be timing that and uh, I would invite the public to address the council now please come forward oh they have a signed up list Oh, is there a list back there, officers, that one of you could bring to me? Please. The official passing on the Thank you, Josh. So I apologize. We'll we'll go ahead and allow you to speak uh, here, and then we'll jump to the list, and then we'll uh, catch anybody else uh, who would like to. So again, if you would please. I introduce yourself with your name and address and whether you're a resident or property owner in the city and then proceed with your input I'm Jesse Stru. I'm at 3161 East 3200 North Twin Falls Idaho I'm a resident and I actually came tonight um, to invite the City Council and some of the city staff to an event that's being hosted in Twin Falls and I brought you guys some tickets um, and I just wanted to pass those out or leave them here whichever is better do I bring them up or you could up? probably just leave them with oh. Mitch actually if that's handier for you if you had other comments you wanted to, okay. I didn't to give to us? Oh, okay. okay. Then you're welcome to bring those forward and pass them out to us. Thanks, Jesse. This is for one person. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, yeah, we'll get that to him. Jesse, can we bring a guest with us? or are yeah. It's okay. Thank you. There we go. 
All right, thank you. So moving to our list, we have uh, signed up here Nancy Taylor. <coughs> Nancy Taylor, 635 Quincy Street. I am a resident of Twin Falls, mayor and council. I am speaking this evening in support of our city council and city management. The council and city employees do incredible work, all in support of each and every citizen. They do it without malice, issue fair and educated rulings, and yes, they sometimes disagree. We can all disagree on issues, but civil citizens agree to disagree. They do not engage in name-calling, threats, bigotry, and hiding behind their so-called Christian beliefs. Informed and engaged citizens wishing to speak on a subject research the appropriate venue and or governmental agency to air their grievances or present their point of view. They do not waste the time of those who are not charged with dealing with issues that are not within their power or realm. Ignorance wishes to blame everyone and anyone without regard to the steps it takes to protest intelligently and accomplish their goal. My support is with our city council and management who have handled a very difficult situation which, which remember they are not chartered to deal with, with poise and grace. They are citizens who care just as much about our community as we do. Take these protests to the appropriate agencies and this council is not that place. I personally thank the council for their hard work and their commitment to our community. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, next we have Lucy Wills. Good evening. Welcome. Mayor, council, men and women. Thank you for having this forum. I appreciate it very much. Lucy, could you please state your uh, address for the record, oh, yes. please? Do I dare? <laughs> 816 Cherokee Lane, Twin Thank Falls, you. Idaho. I am a, um, a resident and um, in Twin Falls, the city of Twin Falls. So I came here tonight to express my thoughts regarding some of what's been happening in the uh, meetings for the past few weeks and to try and understand what the function is and why you were elected. Uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, but the function of this body is to conduct business to make sure that we have law and order that promotes safety to all of us by having a functional and well-trained police department, fire department, and water department, um, and all other departments, et cetera, et cetera. The last few meetings have been somewhat of a circus and have been made and have made a mockery of um, what this is, what this body is supposed to mean and represent. And the people that have come before it that come before it for actual city business have been made to wait hours so that a small group who obviously like to hear themselves speak has pretty much manipulated or monopolized that process. There are some constitutional toting, quoting, and handing out who obviously need a refresher course in Civics 101 to know that this body does not control their agendas. They need to look elsewhere to accomplish this. With that being said, I would like to make a pitch for my faith and my Christianity and ask that when I say I'm a Christian, that I am not lumped into the bunch that has called for members of this body to take a bullet between the eyes, for example, or to recommend or suggest that their spouses, daughters, sisters be raped. Please, I beg of you to not consider me one of those Christians. You were elected by a majority of the people that you serve based on your character, your integrity, and your principles. And although you represent everyone, don't believe that, I don't believe that the thoughts or actions of a few speak for the many of us, the majority who believe that in what you do and the time and dedication that you give to our community. This is no longer a refugee problem or any 
anything of the sort. It's become a bitter and angry, um, attention-getting, attention-seeking tactic for for uh, a few. Um, are there Muslims in Twin Falls? Yes, I believe there are. Are there radical members in Muslims in Twin Falls? I'm not sure. Are there Christians in Twin Falls? Most definitely. Are there radical Christians in <laughs> Twin Falls? I believe most definitely, based on what I've seen for the past few weeks, stirring up hatred and trying to convince everyone that they are Christians. And such as there is no room for radical Muslims in Twin Falls, I don't believe there is any room for radical Christians in Twin Falls. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I appreciate you all very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mrs. Wells. Uh, next on the list is Terry Edwards. My name is Terry Edwards. I live in Jerome. I own property in Twin Falls. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to encourage you folks to remember that you're not the victims. The victim is a little girl. This, these, these folks have to respond to victims in the community. That's part of the safety and well-being of the community. As leaders, you need to do that. And uh, I'm sorry if some people have uh, taken upon themselves to make physical or abusive attacks to you, but what needs to be done is do your job. You all volunteered for this. Nobody held a gun or a knife to your throat and made you become a city council person, I don't believe. Uh, but I'll tell you, I remember my dad telling me, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. So that's all the folks that I have who signed up to speak uh, this evening. So if there's anyone else who would wish to, please come forward to the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Glenita Ziderveld. I am from Jerome. And I don't own any property in Twin, but I've lived in the Magic Valley all my life. Um, I have just come from the apartment of the victim. I've been helping the victim out and the family out. And so I'm coming to you. I, I know it's probably not your duty as a council, but coming to you as individuals. We are looking for a house for them to move into because they are still only 100 feet apart, and they don't go outside, and uh, actually the kids are going to come over to my house tonight, so they can actually go outside and play. So I am asking if you guys have any place that they can move to, a house, so they can have their own yard, and so this, this, this little girl can heal. So I really just... I'm asking from the bottom of my heart, we need to concentrate on this family. I'm sorry you guys are being attacked or threatened, but this little girl was attacked. And she needs to heal, and we need a house for her. So if anybody has any idea, they're on limited um, money. Income. You know, they have to have a, you know, a certain price range that they can afford. Mm -hmm. But a group of us are, are coming together to help them to afford something a little bit more than what they have. But I am just asking you as a council, help us find them a house. Because we've, we've looked, and there's like every house that we've looked at, there's like 20 people showing up for one house. So if you guys have any place that would be a safe haven for them to heal, it would be great. Okay. Thank you. Don Hall. Glenita. I was trying to figure out how to say your name from oh, your email earlier. Yes. <laughs> um, so I believe wasn't there a GoFundMe account set yes. up? Are they are they receiving some income oh, there that yes, they can help them? Yes, they are getting the funds, but they don't want to count on that. Sure, they want to make sure it's within their budget of what they can afford after things. You know, so it needs to stay within their budget. But they do have money to help for a down for something maybe a little over their budget for sure. right now but 
because um, of course it's going to be more than what the apartment is that they're in. But we would really, you know, something maybe 975 less, three, three bedrooms preferably, <coughs> two could work. But something that is detached, has their own yard so that the girl can, both of their kids can go outside and play and not be afraid. Right. Um, I know that the Magic Valley Realtors Association. I think uh, uh, they they put out a rentals list uh, fairly we often. Have tried. We have looked at some. We there is. I kid you not. Every place we go to, there's at least twenty people applying for one home. I, I kid you not. So we have really, really been trying. Okay. So we, we, if you we guys will, have any, we we will do what we can to try to identify some of the resources that are available in the and community. And then you can email me and try to email you and yeah. get okay. those connected. I appreciate to you. that. I, I appreciate you uh, you being a good neighbor and doing what you can to help. Okay. And Thank for you. asking respectfully this evening for our assistance. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Suzanne Hawkins, did you have a comment? I was just wondering, Glenita, if you had a chance to contact the Twin Falls Housing Authority. Have they been any resource at all? No. 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 Waiting it's, list. The struggle so. is real. <laughs> I know it is. My, my yeah. children actually had to move out of the area because they could not find a rental house for a yeah. family with small children. I, I understand the yeah. struggle. And they do have pets. They have uh, ferrets, too, but they're under medical. They have like a, <coughs> it's through a doctor's note that they have them, and they're very, <coughs> they're very clean people, so. Mm -hmm. we'll, that. we'll definitely get, get back okay. in touch Thanks. with them. Do you have anything to add? I was just making sure that you had her contact info. Okay. We do. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to address the council this evening? Well, seeing no one, thank you for your public input uh, this evening, and we will move on with the agenda. So we already handled the consent calendar. Uh, so the next item under items for consideration is a request to accept the bid from Taser International Incorporated for the purchase of wearable body cameras, software, and integration and implementation services for $127,510, we have Captain Anthony Barnhart from the Twin Falls Police Department. Welcome, Captain. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to bring forward the uh, body camera bid for your approval this evening. Tonight, I would ask that you approve the bid from Taser International for the purchase of wearable body cameras, software, integration, and implementation services for the total bid price of $127,510. But before we get into that, I just want to give you guys a, a brief uh, recap, if I could. So um, in 2015, as an organization, as one city, we decided that the police department was going to implement body-worn cameras in 2016. In that same year, we identified a grant through the Department of Justice that would help us stand up a body-worn camera program. We applied for that grant and we were awarded $90,000. As part of that grant, it's a matching grant, so we're going to match another $90,000, and we have an additional $49,000 also budgeted just to implement the body-worn camera program for a total of $229,000. Right around that same time that we were awarded the grant, we stood up a uh, body-worn camera project team to help us through uh, implementation. That team is made up of Mandy Thompson out of the city manager's office, Mike Plain out of information services, Officer J.P. O'Donnell from the police department, and Sergeant Brent Wright also with the police department. And the project team has been working extremely hard to get through policy development, which by the way was or has been accepted by the Department of Justice and approved by our command staff. That policy will guide us in the programs that we that we need, and it will also direct police officers on how to use the cameras. We've also been engaged in community outreach, uh, giving several uh, presentations, talking about how we're going to use body cameras in the community, and we've given those to our strategic stakeholders. we presented to service organizations, and more, most recently we had an open house on the campus of uh, the College of Southern Idaho inviting any community member that might be interested to attend that uh, presentation. Captain Chris Talkington has a Well, I, I, I can wait. Question. I was just okay. wondering about the, we'll the on. warranty on nope. the okay. whole package. We'll, we'll hold Absolutely. on and let him get we through get the there. process so just, here. Just to wrap up, uh, we've also tested and demonstrated a couple of different systems. 
and through all of this, we identified well over 30 specifications that we wanted to see in a body camera uh, system. Coming out of this process, we went to open bid on Thursday, June 9th, and by the time it closed on June 23rd, we had four different bids from four different vendors. Based upon our review, the only conforming bid was from Taser International, based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, with a bid of $127,510. We believe Taser's bid is compliant with the conditions and specifications set forward in the bid document, and we believe the other three bids from VView, Digital Ally, and Senworth all submitted bids that are non-conforming to the bid document. With that, I'm happy to speak about the non-conforming bids. Uh, if not, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Chris Talkington. <clears throat> when we discuss <clears throat> the um eventual purchase of a body cam uh, package and, and uh, filming for the officers. We're, uh, I think, collectively the council most concerned that we just uh, agree on the protocols, who is filmed, how long we keep the records, what is evidentiary, what is personal or private filming. Have we moved on that at all? Absolutely, we have, and, and all of that is clearly outlined in our policy that was approved by the Department of Justice and our command staff, and it's all based off of uh, best practices. We put a ton of research into, into the policy. But we didn't have to invent it ourselves. We it's the best practices then. Absolutely. We did not have Good. to invent it ourselves, but I would also mention that we worked in collaboration with our, our prosecuting offices, both uh, Fritz and uh, Grant Lobes. Thank you, Kev. Thank you. Don Hall. Mayor, if you're ready for a motion. Are there any other uh, questions for Captain Barnhart on this? I, I do just want to make a comment in, in reviewing the information. I think the, the the diligence that you and your team put into making sure that the specifications were going to meet uh, the needs of the department now and into the future uh, is, is to be commended. And then as you went through the, the reasons that the other bidders were nonconforming, it was you know, some very specific items like the length of battery to make sure your officers aren't dealing with recharging batteries or dying in the middle of shift and those types of things. So I, I think your team did a, did a great job. And to uh, Councilman Talkington's point, too, <clears throat> these are just the tools, how you use them and how you implement those to help you uh, do your job and make sure that we're uh, protecting the, the safety of our citizens. Uh, I think you've done a great job with that, too. So thank you for the, thank you, the detail Mayor. in this report. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And with that, Don Well said. I would move approval of the, the request to accept the bid from Taser International, Inc. for the purchase of wearable body cameras, software, and integration and implementation services at the bid price of $127,510. I'll second that. A motion by Don Hall, seconded by... Ruth Pierce to uh, approve the accept the bid from uh, Taser International as presented. Is there any further discussion from the council? Excuse me. Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Hawkington. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Captain. Mayor. Next on the agenda, we have a presentation of the city manager's recommended budget for fiscal year 2017 for strategic plan focus areas 7, responsible community, and focus area 8, internal organization, uh, followed by citizen input. Welcome, Travis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So tonight we're going to talk about two areas of our strategic plan. One is going to be a responsible community. And the second is going to be our internal organization. The internal organization that really is um, the heart of where we're at. And I would be remiss if we didn't just, if I ask the council, and this might be inappropriate, just to take a few minutes to reflect on the tragic events that have occurred throughout the country uh, regarding, regarding police officers and how police officers are uh, being attacked across our country. We have police officers that are very dedicated into our community. We pray for their safety every night. But if we could just take a minute to, uh, for those around the country, you know, that would be appreciated.
So again, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, tonight is uh, focus areas seven and eight, being a responsible community. And, and this really is important to have that conversation that our city's strategic plan really governs the financial and policy decisions that we set forth on an annual basis. This strategic plan was uh, created in 2012. It was implemented in 2013, and it will go through its first official review later this fall. And over the center vision, you will see eight overarching areas, eight areas that we have created as primary focus areas to realize the vision that was created by our citizens through a series of outreach processes, which is very similar to the process that we will use moving forward, all to realize the vision that our community has set forward for 2030. The vision elements are areas for us to strive, areas for us to try to achieve. And what we hope is that through concentrated action and diligent pursuit of these objectives, we will become the community that our citizens want us to become. Before we begin talking about that, this is obviously we want to get to the end of the story first. We want to know how much is this going to cost me. And right now, as we shared last week and we will continue to share, we have part of the puzzle answered today. We have that part of the puzzle answered for those services that we completely control what those costs are going to be, which are going to be the water, utility, and sanitation uh, fees. And you'll notice that in total we're looking at about $1.19 per month for those three services for the average user inside of the city of Twin Falls. That average user is someone who is defined by uses 18,000 gallons of water on a monthly basis that goes up to the 8,000 gallon sewer cap uh, per month and then has also a residential dwelling that receives both solid waste and sanitation or solid waste and recycling services. You'll notice right now that the tax rate piece is listed as unknown. And the tax rate in Idaho is different than some places because we don't assign mills, we look at a tax rate. And a tax rate is a mathematical formula that takes government spending, and we know how much we're proposing, but we don't know the total taxable value. Essentially, we don't know how to divide the pie so that each property pays its fair share per $1,000 of total taxable value. That number is produced by the county assessor, and we will receive that number sometime in August. And so as we continue to move forward, know that we recognize that this is an important part of that equation. But at this point in time, it's not a place that we can fully answer. And, and we hesitate on guessing because in past years, as you know, we've guessed and we've guessed really wrong. And so we've decided to get out of that guessing game and we really want to be able to focus and provide good, concentrated, solid information uh, as we have that. So this is what the vision of focus area number seven is for our community. And it says that Twin Falls community has retained its human face as it has grown over time. It talks about how the community is actively engaged. It talks about how all institutions, public, private, civic, art, religious, nonprofit, are working collectively and collaboratively for the betterment of our organization. And this is one of those primary focus areas that really calls the need for partners. Because when you're looking at community and creating community, the city is a component. And the city has the ability to lead, but it does not have the ability to serve in all of those different areas. And that's where our partners really help us secure the responsible community objective. Our area is to be inclusive and to ensure that we're involving the community. And there are things that we're going and doing on an, on, on an annual and routine basis that we are committed to transparency. And we're going to continue to openly operate in a transparent manner by continuing to engage the community. And we're going to dedicate human talent and resources to city fairs through intentional outreach programs that involve the community from transportation planning to land use planning, to um, other different types of aspects that we really believe that the community's input adds 
better and higher value than if we try to do this alone. That we're going to continue to build outreach to those groups that maybe are not as connected to our entity as we would like, but they're incredible, valuable members of our community. We started our outreach program to the Senior Citizen Center. We've also started that same outreach to the Latino uh, community. And we are going to continue to dedicate resources towards those ends. And we'll continue to do that and find other groups that we don't necessarily see as being completely represented here to make sure that their voices and access to our local government is equal to everyone else. We're also going to go through that process to revise the strategic plan like I shared. That's that cardinal document. We'll start in September and we'll enter that, that contract in September, but it will be longer than a single month process that will need time and talent from the city moving forward into the subsequent fiscal years. And then we've also have some capital investment. Capital investment for public art, repairs and maintenance to ensure that our library remains world class, fireworks, municipal band, and then obviously the municipal powers outsource grants where we increased that amount this year to reflect the total allocation that the council awarded this year, recognizing as we saw through all those conversations, the need was far greater than what we had. And so we increased that uh, this year so that there's $100,000 for the municipal outsource grants, which was the amount that was appropriated. And we have already set aside the money for the band. So with that, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that is focus area seven. Again, it's a, it's a smaller area because it requires a lot of the partnerships. It's not capital intensive. It's resource driven from the talent that we have already on staff. And those are the goals and objectives that we hope to accomplish through this budget. Chris Talkington. <clears throat> Make one comment. I, uh, I'm particularly taken with our term responsible community. I, I applaud that. But I don't, unfortunately, feel it's reflected in our budget all the way for 2017. Um, again, I'm go, going back to the single can uh, sanitation user um, who uses so little during a month that uh, they are, in effect, subsidizing the wasteful user like myself that has a full big blue. Um, we're only talking about a 1% sanitation hike this uh, coming year. But I'm wondering if the council can rationalize why we offer different recreation rates for golf and swimming, why we offer different rates, water rates on a sliding scale, the more you use, the more you pay, and also why you use um, the sliding scale for the sewer, and yet for the sanitation, that uh, single person within the Twin Falls confines who uh, is on fixed income and may indeed be below the poverty rate, I think we're overlooking and neglecting in our otherwise responsible community budget. I didn't expect a response and I'm happy to hear I didn't get one <laughs> because it's obviously falling on deaf ears. Ruth Pierce. Travis, I have a question and maybe it's a question for Bill or somebody in that department, I noticed that there's the larger blue cans and then there's the smaller blue cans. Is there a different fee for there the smaller? Is. There is. So that could be a for a smaller person seeing your fixed income, it would be a less charge than what I'm paying or Chris is paying. You could be, and I think that there are a whole series of options, and I know members of the team, Lori and Bill, are, are continuing to work with PSI. We owe you a contract, and we heard the council at the last meeting, and we're still working with PSI to find that uh, optimum solution that has been kind of expressed. What is important to remember about the sanitation is that most of the costs are fixed. And, and what happens is uh, if you assign a fee, whether it's fair or not, to all of the users, you're going to spread an even fee across all users. And as you know, if you offset that by the size of the can, the next question is, because there is so much revenue that you need to be able to bring into the support of the system, what happens to the cost that you're going to impact to the other users? And so we're working through that math equation right now, and hopefully we'll be able to pitch some other, um, maybe some solutions for you to look at. 
the largest thing that we're looking at, though, is if you give someone a smaller can, does that restrict their ability to take advantage of the unlimited trash collection system that we have? So is there a way that someone can say, well, I'm only going to pay for this can, but under our current collection system, we allow you to use that can and then to use the entire curb that you have left available for pickup. And so how do you regulate the unlimited connect collection to ensure that the person who is needing, truly needing the small can is receiving the small can and then someone who is trying to take advantage of the system that we've created is held accountable and that system doesn't allow that to move forward. And so we're looking at some of those, those opportunities to present to you. And I'm, I wish I could stand before you to say that we have found the absolute perfect solution. While we've searched, we have yet to find it. We recognize that whatever solution we pitch to you will f could fundamentally change that level of service for some member of our community, maybe both positively and negatively, but know that we're working on that. Travis, do you anticipate that that will Prior to some level of conclusion prior to the adoption of the budget? Yes, it will. <laughs> yes, it will. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions related to Area 7 before Travis moves on in his presentation? Okay, so focus area number 8 is the internal organization. And this is the part that we've spent the most time talking about. This is the place that public. Did you did you need to jump in on the item seven? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I told you I could um, I know that I know that we're we're at the beginning stages of the budget. I know that we at least hinted around to this, but um, involving the community and being a responsible um, community number uh, seven, area seven. One of the things that I think that we absolutely need to do, and I know this is on the plate of at least uh, visiting about, is to get um, a person to start helping with our victims. Uh, we used to have a victim advocate coordinator um, with the city of Twin Falls, and then several years back, I don't even remember when it was, we, we lost that position. And I think some of the uh, issues that we've had recently with some folks and, and I, I think that position could have really helped out to help folks navigate the the whole criminal justice system because it's it's not you know it's not user friendly sometimes and I just think that's so paramount to the service that we can provide I know that the sheriff's department's uh, victims coordinator has helped us tremendously but that's one person for the whole county and um, I really envision maybe if we had one and they had one, they could work together and, and, and share. And, you know, one of them, ha they, they have to take vacation sure. once in a while. Sure. So it would be nice to have someone taking over for the full county and just kind of <laughs> collaborate and work together. Could you maybe give us some kind of indication what your thought process is about that, Travis? So absolutely. So as we shared last week, we have an amount of money that has not been appropriated inside of this budget. Um, as I shared, we had about, we estimated, this is a good example of how when we look at the best information we have available, we sometimes in projecting resources will get it wrong. So we were projecting, la so last year, we had achieved about a 36 million, slightly more than $36 million new construction number, which is the added number of the total taxable value of the city. And the way Idaho code is, is we're able to tax, um, use new construction growth plus the 3%, and that's called our statutory allowance. And so that becomes a pretty critical piece of what it looks like for tax revenues coming in. This year, we were projecting that it would be about $40 million. And we did receive that number, and as I shared with the council last week, it exceeded $68 million. And so that amount of money plus some of the monies that we – um, had not budgeted as we were kind of waiting to see what that total taxable value number is. Right now, we have about $300,000 of funds that have that are available at taking the three at the statutory increases, 
keeping the entire foregone balance intact and using $300,000 for a series of things. Um, I believe that a victim witness coordinator with that, those resources is absolutely one of those things that should be considered for funding. It is not included in my budget because at the point of looking at $40 million, we were making sure that we were taking care of our employees that we had internal to our organization first. And about $60,000 represents about a third of an increase across uh, all of the employees. And so I took caring for the existing staff as a higher priority. While we're talking about that, the other thing that you won't see in terms of staffing in here, and I was going to save this for Brian, but Brian, I'm, while we're talking about it, I'm going to take it now. Um, I've asked um, Mandy and, and members of uh, the PD's command team to take a look at securing another COPS grant to get more police officers. And we have submitted that grant. And you won't necessarily see that into the budget because there is no necessary allocation needed uh, for this time. The front end. But it will be needed as we kind of go forward. And the idea is to continue to find ways to add men and women to the streets and the front line. And it's a double-edged sword. So. Um, you know, Sergeant Brent Wright is still here, and, and, and he can be my witness that he is probably one of the, the strongest advocates in sharing how important it is to make sure that we are compensating our police force so that we can retain them. I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to have an allocation of 72 or 76 officers if you get the grant that are sworn that are working the streets on a daily basis. But if you can't fill 60 of them, it doesn't matter what that total allocation is because they go unfilled. And what we need to make sure is not only are we providing the adequate number of police officers on the streets, but we need to make sure they're compensated at a level that, that the salary considerations in other communities, including the Treasure Valley, is not the primary motive for them leaving. Because all we then become is a revolving door, and we talk about this concept of one city. I'm really getting way ahead in my presentation right now. Mm -hmm. But we talk about this concept of one city and how all departments will work collaboratively to find better programs and services across department lines. One city works when you have strong tenures. It works when you have people who have been able to build connections and relationships for a long period of time. And so here, in a one focus area eight, the reason that I have put such an emphasis on compensation this year is because we need to ensure that we can do everything that we can to not only retain, but also to attract new men and women into our organization across all levels across all departments um, when those vacancies arise and occur. Um, and so to answer your question really long <laughs> I was just wondering when you're going to come back <laughs> around to it. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't have a follow-up. <laughs> I think I, so, so a synopsis is that, yes, we're going to be looking at that and we're going funds to be are visiting available. about it. Funds are available, and if the council believes it, I've had conversations with the chief um, I've asked the chief, I've shared my ideas about what a victim witness coordinator should look like. Um, the chief and I have had conversations about a victim witness coordinator, and I think that he would welcome that into the budget should the council agree that that would be an appropriate use of that $300,000 that we have not allocated, or maybe it's a plant, something else that we put into the budget. Well, well certainly it wouldn't cost $300,000 to do it, but I, no, I we, would we just... Estimate, uh, it, we estimate that it's slightly under $62,000 right. fully burdened for that position. Right. I would just uh, uh, reiterate what I said to the council then, that I, I don't know what's more important than for us to be able to help victims weave their way through the system, because, again, the system's not the easiest system to get through. Um, and, uh, I mean, we, we had a, somebody come forward tonight that talked about trying to find housing for someone. I mean, it could go as far as that, have resources that they could um, help folks in their time of trouble. So I just, uh, I advocate for that. Thank you. 
So on an internal organization, I'm going to try to remember what I was going to say. If I kind of get a little bit repetitive, I apologize. Um, but really, I think that we're looking for the last sentence here, and that is a high degree of competency is provided by a lean, properly compensated and respected core staff. I mean, at the end of the day, public services are delivered by the men and women who work for the city of Twin Falls. That's the human face of our organization. That's the place where I believe that we need to focus our resources this year and subsequent years being able to move forward. So these are some of the strategic planning objectives. One is to provide a high effective professional staff to provide the high quality services and residents to our citizens, our businesses, and our visitors. I think it's really important to remember that the city of Twin Falls is an urban hub with a service population that is defined by the Chamber of Commerce and St. Luke's that contains a geographic you know, population of about 250,000 people. And on any given day inside of the city of Twin Falls, we grow to about 70 to 75,000 people. And the human and the physical infrastructure that we have needs to be used to accommodate that. And when we start looking at talent and how we're going to be able to offer higher, better services, it's important to recognize the size of the community that we're looking at. It's not just our census population that we offer services to. In fact, last year, the police department, through their research, was able to illustrate that nearly half of the citations and half of the misdemeanors that are issued by the, citizen, by the Twin Falls Police Department are to citizens that do not have Twin Falls City addresses. <clears throat> we offer a level of service regardless of address. And in order to effectively offer that service, we need to make sure that we're able to do these different types of things. So the first is that we're giving proper tools and training as one of the objectives. And you'll see that we're going to continue to look at the digitizing of building permits, we're expanding our code enforcement software to be able to be used by animal control for one city. We're going to be upgrading our Granica software, not only for here, but also for additional live streaming capabilities that will be able to be transferred over to the new city hall. We're looking at an FF&E budget for not only the new city hall, but also for the public safety bids. That is the entire for, for both. And then we're going to continue to invest in one city that we continue to send people back to the University of Virginia and we continue to bring them here because we want to make sure that members of our team are looking at those opportunities. We have employees today that come up to us and say, I hope I get to go next. It is really something that we want to continue with. We believe it's making great strides. We believe that the council's allowance for us to do the city retreat and then also to have a one city planning session for those individuals to go forward is paying dividends not only in connection and collaboration, but also in the work product that's realized by our citizens. Chris Tuck. If I could ask a question on that uh, Virginia training. Uh, I, I have no doubt that there's some tangible benefits, but uh, this is an expensive program. There's no doubt about it. And do we have any way to measure success on a intangible like employee training I don't know if you can do it on retention uh, reduction in workload but I, I think it's only fair to the citizenry that are paying the bill to say how do you know it's working yep I think that's fair so maybe what we should do is in the past we've had individuals who've attended the one city training we did it very early on and they came and talked about what they've seen I can share with you what I'm seeing as the benefits but let us, let us take a minute, and we'll actually have people that have gone to both the one city training as well as the training here in town, and we'll have them come and share how they're applying that in their day-to-day -day activities as it uh, helps them serve the customers. I think their testimonials will be far more impactful uh, than what I might share with you. And we'll do that during this budget session. So treating our employees fairly. And under this, it talks about making sure that our compensation strategies are equitable. And so what we have here is we're looking at a salary table adjustment of about 
that basically takes the entire table and it shifts it and has the compression ratios that would come into play should those triggers be reached and realized. This is in addition to that 4% mid-year adjustment that you've gone forward with. And then across the board, we're looking at a 5% uh, movement based upon performance. And those are the total costs. And that's a lot of money. That is a considerable amount of money when you start looking at wages and increases. But I will also say that I have yet to have a citizen say, send me the police officer in my time and need that you can afford. For us to be able to ensure that we're offering the high level of services, it takes us securing the highest level of talent. And when folks in the Treasure Valley and communities in eastern Idaho, as I shared during those studies earlier this year, are compensating their employees significantly more than where we are, you know that the table movement and the 5% that I'm proposing now doesn't even cross and create the bridge to get us to where they're at. But it's a step in the right direction. And the area, the question is, well, can you always be competing against Boise? Should you be competing against Boise? And I think that what we need to do is recognize that public service professionals are scarce resources. And if this is a simple economics equation, scarce resources can also be considered as luxury goods. And luxury goods in a market have their price. And so the reason that I am recommending this is because I believe in the men and women of the city of Twin Falls. I believe in everything that they do. And we, we owe it them to be fair. We're going to develop a wellness program. We've been working over the course of the last several months with both St. Luke's and Select Health in developing an employee wellness program because we believe that the, the best way that we can reduce or to slow down high cost health insurance increases is to have an well employee core. And we think that helping them become informed about healthy choices and healthy opportunities is something that we should be a part of. We have a funding to support the 15% rate adjustment for health insurance this year covered into the budget. And in order for us to help curb some of that, we believe that we need to focus on wellness. Some of the best practices say that that's where we're at. And then we're going to continue to enhance our recruitment and retention through the one city concepts. We want individuals to become, in uh, to become fully on board with one city as we move forward. So again, this is kind of where we're at. We've illustrated what this part of the budget costs and how we continue to be able to move forward. That didn't turn out very well, that's my fault. Um, but this kind of illustrates the budget calendar if you could read it. Um, so I'll read it for you. Um, so next week you'll, you'll see that we're going to be focusing on strategic planning areas one, two, and three. Um, and I believe Brian has those. And so Brian is going to be talking about those three focus areas next week. Mitch will come back the following week with focus areas four and five. I will have focus area number six, and if all things work on that evening, which might be the perfect alignment of stars, we might be also able to introduce an economic development director on that evening. Um, we will go through, have the public hearings on any necessary rate adjustments that are needed. At this point in time, we're not believing that there are any rate adjustments that would require public hearings. Um, but we would still have to set the maximum spending of the budget. Uh, we would then host the public hearing uh, on the evening of the 29th, and then we would ask the council to consider the budget on Monday, August 29th, as we continue to move forward. Every step along the way, every single area, um, we would encourage the citizens to share their thoughts with staff, to share their thoughts with council, to participate in the public meeting, to help shape this budget to help us understand the services that they want to see uh, delivered in this upcoming fiscal year. And with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Any questions from the council for Travis? Haven't you had enough? <laughs>
enough questions. We're, we're just getting started. <laughs> I do not see any, Travis. Okay. So as we have done in every step of the budget process and will continue to do so, uh, we would give an opportunity for members of the public to give input on the budget. Any uh, thoughts related to uh, the presentation this evening or ongoing spending of those dollars? Yeah, come on forward, sir. If you would please introduce yourself and state your address for the record. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Paul Thompson. I am a resident of Twin Falls, just live a couple of blocks from here. If you need my address, I don't mind giving it to you, but I don't like giving it out in public, if that's all right. I think we'll be fine with the Twin Falls. Okay. I'll be happy to give it to you. Come visit me sometime. <laughs> um, so, so, Mr. Mayor and, and members of the council, I'm so grateful to live in the city of Twin Falls. Uh, for 15 years, I've had the privilege of living here. And just recently, I've uh, moved my widowed mother because I think Twin Falls is a good place to live. And so I, I want to just speak to you in relationship to the budget and make appeal to you uh, to, uh, to continue doing the good work that you're doing. And I'm grateful for the, the, the partnered work that I have in the city as uh, a member of uh, the, the citizen group number seven. I didn't know I was a member of citizen group number seven until tonight. So uh, I, I remember a reasonable and responsible person, uh, a partner in the community, uh, a pastor in the community, and grateful for everything that the city affords, uh, the people that I pastor, and my own personal uh, household and my family at large. And so I, I don't have a question for you. I have an appeal to you to continue to do your good duty. And uh, I give you my word that I'll continue to do my duty in relationship to spiritual matters in our community. And, and I'm grateful for the unique and distinct difference that we have. And, and I'm grateful, again, to, the, to my Lord and Savior that I live in the city of Twin Falls. And I know there's a lot of reports about people worried about living in the city. And uh, I, I haven't had one sleepless night yet. Uh, I do not say that to diminish the seriousness of all issues that are before us, but I want to encourage you. Uh, do not be waived. Do not be moved to adjust your duty uh, to accommodate what would appear to be fear and misunderstanding around the country about the good city of Twin Falls. Uh, I'm grateful for you. I will disagree with you, and I've even stood at this podium before to disagree with you, and I think it's an amazing thing that as a member of the community, a citizen, as a pastor in a community, that I can do so and not live in fear that I'm going to go home and lose my house because I've disagreed with you, that I hold a different opinion than you, or that my church is going to be taxed because of a different opinion that we have. So I stand before you today, give you my word. I will, do, I will continue doing my duty, and I'm grateful for your charge and your duty that you have in, in a shared group that we have in, in area number seven. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for your continued partnership and for your participation in the process. Nikki Boyd. Yes, I just want to say thank you very much. Very well spoken. Is there anyone else from the public who'd like to provide input on the budget this evening? Seeing no one, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is items from the city manager or the city council. Mr. Rothweiler. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we sent out a PSA. I sent you out an email, but we're also going to take an opportunity to talk about the Eastland Road construction project. Uh, just for those viewers that we might have this evening that may have missed both. Uh, so we're, we're started the Eastland Road construction rebuild project that will run until about mid-September of this year. It really does fix that critical section from the underpass uh, moving, moving south. Um, there are detail detours that are established. We've contacted and worked with the individual businesses out there who are going to be directly affected, but we would encourage our citizens to recognize that there might be some delays, and there are certainly some detours in that area from now until um, 
later this year. It's a million dollar project that is being performed by PMF. It is slightly under budget um, in comparison to what we came forward with and we're looking at how we might be able to maybe further that project. There is still subsequent sections of Eastland. One of the things that we're doing to secure that is we're moving the asphalt and we're turning it into a concrete road surface so it has much longer life and durability, especially in those truck areas. So we wanted to make sure that the citizens were aware, that you had awareness, and if you had any questions that uh, you were able to respond to that. Donna, do you have a question related Not to that? Not about that. Okay. The, the next thing I have for you is just a quick reminder. Um, Chief Ron Clark um, will be retiring on Friday, and there's a celebration of his over 40-year career that will take place uh, on Friday. We would encourage, it's uh, Friday afternoon, I believe it starts at 3 o'clock. Um, we would encourage you to, to, to come. It's in the bay of the, of the fire station. Um, really, it's a celebration of a, of a phenomenal career. Uh, and uh, I, as a, Ron has, has been on the member of our city's executive leadership team. And we are certainly going to miss the wisdom and the, uh, the experience that he brings to the table. And so we would invite you to uh, come and celebrate with us. This is his send off. We let our, our folks determine how they want to have their celebration and this is, this is what he has chosen. Thank you, Travis. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. So on Friday afternoon, um, Don Hall and I had the opportunity to attend a ribbon cutting event for some homes that were built to help um, fundraise for the Boys and Girls Club of Magic Valley. Since we're talking about responsible community tonight and partnerships, I see Gerald Martin is here and it was his leading that brought this project together and was able to bring something to our community to light that nobody thought was possible. I think during that meeting there were probably 10 minutes where they just read off names of people in our community that donated, volunteered, or helped to realize this project. But the homes have been built and now they're being sold and the money is going back to the Boys and Girls Club to help them in the future. And with that, I don't know if the council remembers, but at the time we did agree to waive some of the building fees for them. And so we were listed on their partners in the project and they gave us a very nice gift that I have here to present to the city on behalf of Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the camera can see it. It's a nice clock with our name and the Boys and Girls Club logo on it. Cool. Here you go. Am, I, am I the city? You're you the are city. right I'm now. Gonna, I'm going <laughs> to give it to you somewhere. I'm going to give it to you. Mitch. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you to the Boys and Girls Club and all of those partners. Dunhall. I'll just reiterate, uh, it was uh, Gerald's leadership in that. Um, you said it quite well, but just one more uh, kudos to Gerald for him um, making that whole process and uh, ability for the Boys and Girls Club to realize those funds to better serve our kids. Uh, what I wanted to bring up, you brought up roads and it finally hit me, and maybe this is for you, Mitch, if you could talk to Jackie. I've had several folks, as well as myself, notice that the intersection of Frontier and Falls where you right next to that fire department, that that road is gone. It's almost uh, um, on frontier itself. It's it's chipping up and and looks really bad. And, and um, I didn't know if that was on the list this year to be rebuilt. It seems to me that's not a an overlay. That's a rebuild. We're, we're get, we'll check to see if that is truly part of the public road system. Okay. Um, it's the north side of Falls. We'll, we'll look into that. Oh, it goes by the park, though. Yeah, I know, but we'll look into see if that is actually a public thoroughfare. Okay. We'll look. Yeah, I, I would assume that the uh, fire department well, probably drives know. that quite often. So. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anything else from the council? All right. We're going to go ahead and move into our public hearing, which was scheduled for no earlier than 6 o'clock. So uh, this evening we have a request for a special use permit to construct and operate a medical dental office 
on property located at the southeast corner of Bridgeview Boulevard and Locust Street North. Uh, Gerald Martins on behalf of Temple View Properties. Welcome, Mr. Martins. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Gerald Martins. I'm here representing Temple View Properties, the owner of the property at the intersection of Locust and uh, Bridgeview. Uh, uh, at the, where the little red X is on the uh, exhibit. Uh, this is part of the East Park uh, commercial subdivision number two and one of the conditions of uh, in this uh, subdivision was that a special use permit be provided by the city council which makes it very unique for any development within this subdivision. So you've heard me here three times. This is my third time here in about three meetings. The first one was the Surgery Center. The next one was First American Title. And this is a, the third one. And, and we've got another project forthcoming, so I'll be back again. But, uh, basically, what we're proposing here is a one-story professional medical office building. Uh, that's fine. Uh, Basically, uh, sitting on the corner, it's it's really in kind of a fishbowl. It's open to three uh, to public, three frontages in a lot of ways, and so the architecturally, we uh, I believe come up with a plan that is quite attractive from any and all directions. Uh, it's quite compatible material-wise and color-wise with the other two buildings that are going adjacent to it. Uh, it is an office building. Normal hours are eight to five. Five days a week, uh, uh, we have reviewed the staff recommendations for approval of a permit, uh, and we concur. And as with the others, uh, two previous ones, the lighting on this project will be done project-wide as part of the master project and operated and maintained, as will the landscaping by the Property Owners Association. And so the lighting will be, will be very conscious to make sure that the lighting is installed in such a way that none of the light source is seen from off from the property with special attention to the residential properties to the south. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Chris Talkington. Gerald, I guess you don't have any problem, and it is feasible. I'm asking both parties on the pressure, pressurized irrigation okay. system. Yes. Uh, there's a ditch on the other side put, of would you want to put up the, the Madrona, but I wasn't sure if water was accessible uh, in that area. Not, uh, uh, let's go to the flat. Uh, this development uh, called East Park Commercial Subdivision Number Two. Number one is this just the, med the surgery center. Two is a tan colored parcel. Uh, that there will be six lots in that development. The brown parcel is East Park Commercial no Subdivision Number Three, which will be coming through. The review process has now been submitted, um, and this is the irrigation ditch that bisects the property. All property owners, all three of the developers are collectively working to install a pressurized irrigation system at this location, and it will be installed this summer uh, for irrigation before any of these homes are completed and ready for occupancy. Excellent. should point out and that will uh, that it is a private pressurized irrigation system not one that will be maintained by the city oh okay. hmm. <laughs> all right we'll have our staff report from Jonathan Spendlove thank you mayor Berger so um, the staff reports no different from the last couple really um, we're looking at just a slightly different location um, you've seen this a couple different times from March April May June. Um, the plat will be checked. The building permits are going to be checked through the normal process. Really, we have a PUD that kind of dictates the process we have now for the special use permit. We, we reiterated that a couple different times. So the zoning code we're dealing with is professional office overlay and the R2 zone, which requires a special use permit. And they've got uh, parking requirements and other requirements such as landscaping, screening, storm drainage. We'll check all of those on the building permit. The plans they've given us appear to follow all those requirements. We do the final official review during that building permit stage. Um, the PUD agreement's also got um, additional development restrictions. 
Um, for those looking or listening online um, that didn't hear the previous ones, I'll read those. All buildings constructed on this property will be constructed using residential style architecture and will have an architectural finish aesthetically pleasing. All professional buildings in this area will be limited to single story construction. Buildings within 350 feet of Locust Street may have a maximum of maximum size of 10,000 square feet. All other buildings will be limited to 6,000 square feet. Buildings facing Cheney, which this one is not. Um, parking occur in the north of the building. And landscaping, perimeter landscaping along Locust Street North, Cheney and Bridgeview shall be installed at a man minimum depth of 20 feet from back of curb or future curb. The PUD also contains other building standards above <clears throat> and beyond the base zoning code. These items will be reviewed and enforced at the time of building permit submittal as well. The site plan and elevation submitted by the applicant appear to be in compliance with the requirements listed above and within the PUD agreement. It's, this is not an official review. We'll do that during the building permit process. The impacts, as with the others, really come down to traffic and light. Um, the traffic will increase in this area, but they are in close proximity to Locust, Bridgeview, Madrona, and Poline Road. We don't think um, the roads will be deteriorated to a point that they'll uh, be terrible. Um, there will be more traffic because of businesses that previously, previously was bare ground. Um, however, none of those um, access points directly go into neighboring, um, basically residential homes. Um, you have to kind of go around. Only people going through those neighborhoods will be the people living there. Um, most of them are dead end streets around it. So we don't believe the traffic will have a huge impact. The lighting, as Gerald said, we've made a, a point with them to make sure that it's shielded from the neighboring property owners. And in general, professional offices make pretty good neighbors. The operating hours, um, the landscaping is usually kept really well, and most of the stuff takes place inside. So we believe it's an okay fit for this area and a, a decent development for this corner. In between the heavy commercial of Home Depot and the others, um, res retail, and then the residential to the south. So it's a good buffer between the two. Um, other, uh, pretty much gone through all of that. So should the council grant this uh, special use permit? As presented, staff recommends the following conditions. One subject to the site plan, am plan amendments as required by building engineer, engineering, fire and zoning officials to ensure compliance with applicable city code requirements and standards and compliance with the East Park PUD agreement number 213. Number two, subject to a PI system being approved by the city engineering department prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy. And number three, subject all lighting being downward facing and light source being shielded from nearby residential properties. That's all. Thank you, Jonathan. Any questions for Jonathan? Chris Talkington. Ready for a motion? We got to do a public hearing still. Gotcha. So, any any questions for Jonathan? Seeing none, we will open it now to the general public to provide testimony on this request. If there is anyone from the public wishing to testify, please come forward. Seeing no one, we will close the public testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, Mr. Martins, did you have any rebuttal you'd like to give to the overwhelming testimony there? <laughs> Certainly not any rebuttal. Uh, I just wanted to point out, which I intended to before, that uh, Cheney Street, along the south boundary of this, in this entire quarter of a mile, uh, which has been a half street for many years, ever since the residential subdivision was developed, will be fully developed to full width as part of these three contiguous projects that are being done now. So. Uh, we will improve some of the traffic uh, uh, facilities in the area. Thank you, Gerald. Chris Dockington. I, I'm a little unfamiliar familiar with how many private PI systems we have in the city and the, the consequences of that downstream or the city taking over any liability. Anybody in the city uh, answer any of that for me? Or Gerald, or what's your knowledge of it? I appreciate that. I can think of five or six that I've been involved with, private systems. Uh, what we they typically occur in an area like this where it's more of an infill, and uh, the water shares are still available because the canal goes through the property. Uh, they function <laughs> relatively well, or well, especially in a commercial project, because you have an organization that's active to operate it and assess the property owners, unlike you might have in, if it were in a residential subdivision where you have uh, 
sometimes homeowners associations are relatively inactive or dysfunctional, uh, but uh, we have a property owners association. These property owners are building these office buildings, are making large investments in this property. Uh, the, the association not only maintains a pressure irrigation system, but all of the perimeter landscaping, all of the interior landscaping, all of the parking lot maintenance. So it, it needs to be active and it will be active. And it's very important to their to their business and the success of their businesses to have a, a, a functioning property owners association. So right. that answer your question. All right. Well with that I will close the public hearing and turn it over to council for deliberation. Chris Talkington. I'll try it the fourth time. <laughs> I have to give it. I would move <coughs> approval for the special use permit to construct and operate a medical dental office for property at the southeast corner of Bridgeville and Locust, subject to the three uh, attached conditions to the permit. I'll second. A motion by Chris Doggington, seconded by Nikki Boyd, to approve the special use permit as presented and including the staff recommendations. Is there any further discussion from the council? Seeing none, Chair and roll call vote, please. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Motion passes 6 to 0. We'll see you again soon, Gerald. Uh, with that, we are ready to move to the uh, last item on the agenda, which is adjournment. And we have a uh, a request to move to uh, to adjourn into executive session under Idaho Code 74206-1A to consider hiring a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent wherein the respective qualities of individuals are to be evaluated in order to fill a particular vacancy or need. This paragraph does not apply to filling a vacancy in an elective office or deliberations about staffing needs in general. Council wishes. So moved. Don Hall. So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> a motion by Don Hall, seconded by Suzanne Hawkins to move into to adjourn into executive session as stated. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Chair and roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. And just to let everyone know we will uh, not be making any, any decisions while we are in, are in executive session, nor will we be reconvening following the executive session. With that, we are adjourned.